Kiki's Mandarin level will be lower than that of local children, and her English is at P2 level. How will teachers accommodate and challenge her in both instances? 2. We have most of the textbooks except Chinese language for primary school small reader 1B. Do we bring them all in each day? 3. We have none of the work prescribed spaces of a new and modern lifestyle. Can I question? That's a camera. It's cool, Mummy. Can I take a video? Okay. This mass relocation which happened to the majority of Singapore... Mummy, mm-hmm. can you just turn on? I'm not sure. Can you help me? There is a button at the top. When another woman was to be exhibited at War Manifesto After in Bangkok... A temporal distancing from the consuming immediacy of pregnancy and childbirth, some artist mothers began or continued to employ their maternal position as a larger framework and turned to their children as subjects. I never wanted to be a mother, however, ultimately decided to make a baby for my partner, who really likes them. Unsurprisingly then, the experience of early motherhood nearly broke me. Not least because the well-being of my child immediately took precedence over my own from the perspective of healthcare professionals. I understood that Kiki would be taken away from me had I been truly honest about how much I hated being a mother and how my world had crumbled into physical pain, drudgery, imprisonment, boredom, and a soul-crushing sense of loss of myself. And I didn't want my child taken away. That would mean that I had failed at being a mother and I could not accept being a failure and the sheer terror of accidentally causing her death through forgetting that I had a child, having enjoyed 40 years free of responsibility for anyone but myself, not to mention hurling her out the window when inconsolable. That terror haunted my days and nights for many years. Let me give some reasons why a mother hates her baby wrote the renowned pediatrician Donald Winnicott in 1947. The baby is ruthless, treats her as scum, an unpaid servant, a slave. He dominates. Life must unfold at the baby's rate. And she has to love him, excretions and all. He is suspicious, refuses her good food, and makes her doubt herself, but eats very well with his aunt. After an awful morning with him, she goes out and he smiles at a stranger who says, Isn't he sweet? My children, wrote the poet Adrian Rich, cause me the most exquisite suffering of which I have any experience. It is the suffering of ambivalence, the murderous alternation between bitter resentment and raw-edged nerves and blissful gratification. That terror of motherhood has mostly dissipated over the years as I got better at mothering with practice. However, being my child's primary caregiver, my time, and by extension what is possible for my life, is wholly determined by her needs. Anne Karp writes, Becoming instantly interruptible, she must put aside the threads of her personal existence and attend to the child. Are we really interested in the maternal? Are we really interested in women and the labour in the house? The shapes of time restrictions tightens the body, constricting it to house, to choices, to closeness, to exclusion. Are we really interested in what it means to work, the emotionality, the practicalities? Are we really interested in the needs? What is it that we are watching? What is it that you want to watch? Is it the shape of the maternal, an abstract shape? Or is it envisioned in a very tight geometric box? Is it fluid? Is it escaping under the door with gaps? in the outdoor space while you cannot find it anymore? Are we really interested? in what it means to mother. Are we really interested in the mother? What is she doing? What is she thinking? What is she feeling? How are we shaping her? 
how is she shaping herself and so the time takes space and it modifies and molds the body and actions and the collective voice is what it's needed for that materiality to be seen hold it in a time and space and structures and vision and visioned for the maternal experiencing leaving leaving the indoor leaving the loneliness and reaching out how does it look are you still watching are we really interested in what shame and shame i know that pregnancy and motherhood has been an incredibly creative fruitful and productive experience for you diana and perhaps we occupy almost opposite ends of the maternal experience spectrum. And yet our time is probably similarly structured around our young children's needs. 6 to 9 p.m. dinner bath bedtime. Term time versus holidays. The sudden and extended COVID-19 homeschooling. The thinking, planning and execution of nutritionally sound and kid-acceptable meals. The broken chunks of work time before 7 a.m., between 9 a.m. and 3 p.m., and after 9 p.m. What Lisa Baretza talked about, maternal time and the time of care generally, or time that can only go at the pace of the other, and that we tend to associate with female time. This was what you responded to regarding the timing of our forum. 7.30 p.m. is smack in the middle of dinner, bath and bedtime. And this is a non-negotiable fact for mothers or carers for at least a decade or more of our lives. So yes, I think we should perform bedtime simultaneously. I feel differently now that Kiki is older and I now understand that it was or is in fact babies that I can't stand. Little children who have acquired language are actually delightful creatures and the freshness with which they see the world. Rosika Parker was a parent to a 19 and 20 year old when she said this. Some women find it easier to mother babies than teenagers and vice versa. Women may hate me for saying this, but I've enjoyed mothering teenagers. Talking comes easier to me than playing. As a result, traditional extended families and complex, long-established social networks were dismantled. Consequently, these new housing arrangements have often resulted in a deep sense of loss and isolation for the older Depictions women. Depictions of the physical changes of maternity far outnumber other references to motherhood in contemporary art. While other artist mothers approach a broadly defined maternal-child relationship, fewer examine the cultural and political implication of motherhood or the negative or deviant possibilities for mothers. Barbara T. Smith, one of the earliest American contemporary artists to focus at work on motherhood, confronted cultural assignation of, of the bad mother. Meet left her husband to pursue a career as an artist, which the courts interpreted as a resignation of maternal status, a word in custody of the children to her husband. Smith's ritual meal, the first of many food-centred performances, invited guests in surgical garb to consume a meal with surgical tools amidst projections of open-heart surgery. The intense communal ritual in part memorialized the loss of Smith's children. Myril Chernick tackles the gender constructions of motherhood as well as cultural meats that define the good and bad mother. On the table is not autobiographical but instead presents a series of diverse narratives about motherhood. Going several steps further, Catherine Bell raises the uncomfortable possibility of deviant motherhood, giving voice to malevolent motherhood and to the maternal potential for violence. Bell's works conjure the mother who leaves, the mother who abuses, and the mother who kills. In Baby Drop, 2007, a series of stealth performances, Bell abandoned stale baby shaped cake made for a related piece, making a baby in space she knew would be frequented by mothers symbolically enacting the crime of infant abandonment. Somewhere, also immense relief and gratitude 
that Kiki doesn't appear to have registered my early bad mothering. Her memory seems to begin where babyhood ended and when I began to regard her as an enchanting small human, as opposed to an incomprehensible and aggravating alien bent on destroying me. And perhaps because she's so secure in my adoration of her, she's very forgiving towards me when I flounder, such as when my crap homeschooling skills led to much shouting me and tears her. Also somewhere, I'd like to have the spoken content feature read aloud the digital communication I've generated over the last months relating directly to Kiki Care, making visible a tiny fraction of the invisible and unpaid physical, mental, and emotional labor that mothers regularly perform. Perhaps this might be something that we could both activate, both yours and mine, played simultaneously, so the resulting layered audio is a cacophony of care. Also somewhere, the blissful gratification and depth of love that all of this maternal time and labor yields. Can the value of this love and joy be measured against all that we invest in our children? The real lives of real families are mediated by the photographers or by social rules and conventions. As a result, the photographs stress the universal quality of motherhood. The fact that maternal love is not mediated by social and economic status. The way that women are portrayed in relation to their children justifies such an assumption. Most adult models are holding their daughters close, touching with affection or leaning towards each other. Several models have the children on their laps, some breastfeed them, others stand close by embracing or touching each other. The children cling to the women, their bodies vulnerable and soft, in need of protection, or the mother stands in front as if protecting the child from the viewers and potential dangers. Some of the portraits of homeless mothers bring to mind iconic anthropological photographs of indigenous peoples or women from marginalized poor communities with the image of a woman breastfeeding her child being a vivid example. By accentuating the breasts and the unity of the mother's body with her children, the artist evoke the idea of the mother as uncivilized, associated with nature rather than culture. This photograph reveals other layer of interest as well. The mother, larger than life, looks strictingly passive and humble, sitting in a tiny kitchen, breastfeeding one child while holding the other on a lap. She looks weary, but her face seems distant and calm. Her body bears the marks of childbearing, big breasts and rounded belly. The level suited to them. The woman also, to please would you mind using Kiki's Chinese name in class? Luhui Kai. Holy shit, she absolutely refused to uncurl her legs and toes. We had to wrestle her to force her legs straight for treatment, with her howling the place down. Nurses said this treatment is too traumatizing for her, although they've had three-year-olds have this treatment without so much as I yelp. Different pain thresholds. So at the next appointment, we'll see the doctor again and review other options. When will this all end? I wanted to begin by acknowledging that, of course, we could make all sorts of trouble of this notion of unique. And rather than speak to a uniqueness, I'd like to instead argue for what might be common about maternal performance aesthetics. And when talking about maternal performance, I mean to include those that happen beyond the theatre space and the ones by mothers who wouldn't consider themselves artists. A memory that sticks out from early childhood is being at primary school and my friends asking me why my mum spoke the way she did. My mum called it common. 
Embarrassed and a bit ashamed, I told her not to speak in front of my friends ever again. So my mum used to put on a posh voice after that, a micro performance she performed in the school playground. My mother, the commoner in disguise, performing for an audience of other mums and teachers, a performance that was ruptured and leaky by the way the words rolled unauthentically off her tongue. Maternal performance in a live art context has a trend for the autobiographical. There seems a desire towards an authentic representation. Anything less seems to trouble, and I'm really intrigued by this dissatisfaction with representation. My PhD research, Playing Kate, examines maternal performance and this notion of common. It's about class, and it began by thinking about the problem of mother artists performing or playing dangerous or dirty, and the exclusion or consequence of that for mothers who are actually really deemed dangerous or dirty in their real life by the government, by the media, perhaps even by other mothers. Playing Kate is specifically about one very iconic maternal performance that happened in 2012. Whilst I fed my own tiny baby on the sofa, I watched on TV along with him around the world as new mother Kate Middleton famously stepped out of the Lindo wing, carrying the new heir to the English crown in a maternal mass spectacle that David Cole in his book Capitalised Education might call an ironic, absurd and rather strange foregrounding that obscures economic and ecological catastrophe while seeking royal survival and expansion. Cole articulates the complex production of Kate as media object through the way in which history, events, time and space, desire, becoming and thought have been manipulated and represented to obscure the truth. In Playing Kate, I examine how Kate, as me object, through a relationship to the maternal, works to hide any sense of inequality in a series of maternal performances that obscure the truth. Playing Kate articulates how through a performative process of replicating, that which is obscured will always leak through. Whilst examining this maternal spectacle in relation to the different understandings of common, I become aware of a series of other maternal performances by groups of mothers that can be best understood a notion of replication. I borrow the term replicate from an online phenomenon where women and mothers, sometimes along with their children, replicate Kate through online performances as they attempt to copy Kate in as much detail despite the budget as they try to demonstrate their shared commonality to be just like Kate. The performance by Kate outside the Lindo wing, if we are to consider and value it as a maternal performance, understand that Kate both constructs and produces maternal performances in public settings, can too be viewed as a direct replication of the late Diana Spencer. By Kate's third maternal performance outside the Lindo wing, Kate's post-birth trauma feminine makeover transformation has finally caused a subsequent backlash by a group of different mothers who enacted a vocation of a different kind, an online protest which involved mothers posting exhausted, unflattering post-birth pictures in a common declaration that Kate is not like us. Many mothers performed and posted their images on the labour ward with playful mockery and self-deprecation, which in a way further reinforced the position that Kate is the epitome of aspiration. My project, Playing Kate, began from this same place of replication as I began to copy Kate, but in my own locale with my baby. My replications through their slippages worked to foreground ideas of common and class. In this image outside my NHS hospital, my own lonely replication is further haunted by my own lonely mother's leaving of the hospital with the baby she later abandoned. I later replicated my performance outside the hospital at Motherworks Festival as I performed outside the venue. We could argue that replication is a far wider learned practice. As Cole notes, Middleton as an object now has a secret mesmerizing life of its own, beyond any direct human or societal control. 
as Kate burrows into consciousness. Cole asserts a type of political layering is produced that works on many levels and needs to be peeled away before one realizes the real effects of Kate Middleton as media object in contemporary culture. We could argue that the same peeling away is needed to consider what might be the real effects of Kate Middleton on maternal performance aesthetics. Through playing Kate, we start to see how replication, far from just being a deliberate action by internet fan mums, is actually a more pervasive idea in the performance of posh voices in the playground, in the getting back to normal after the trauma of birth, and I could go on and on and on. My suggestion is that replication is a mechanism whereby the status quo reproduces itself through the maternal experience. And I use the term replicate more than a rather than a more traditional theatrical notion of restage or repeat or reproduce, to shift towards a relationship that is more ambiguous and more complex than one in which simply aims to, it aims to identify or disidentify with the idea of the original. I argue for a deeper understanding of the term replication. If we are to consider maternal performance as a complex layering that doesn't seek out um, it, it doesn't appear to be simple as bad or good, true or false, authentic, unauthentic, that doesn't seek out or demand new, insightful, unique positions, but rather understands that maternal performance has both a subtle and complex relationship with the idea of replication. Maternal performance itself can sometimes exclude, let's say like my mother's forced performance to include herself in the playground, or my performance for a mostly white middle class audience huddled in Side that building, amused and confused by my unclassy performance outside. Perhaps all maternal performance contains replication, that it can be found sliding and slipping and hiding in both the private and the public, in and out of our control. Perhaps it can be found where we least expect to find it. Perhaps it shows up through our attempts to obscure or reveal a truth. Through an embrace of replication, we might see that being common or the common is the thing that might unite us through and in acts of solidarity, kindness and resistance for all maternal figures. If there is anything unique about a maternal performance aesthetic, it can only be understood through what performing mothers have in common. Rather than just thinking of motherhood and mothering or let's say maternal performance as only unique to the individual or the form practice, perhaps maternal performance is the thing all mothers do hold in common and it is through maternal performance aesthetics that we have a potential for a new understanding of the notion of common and maybe a step closer to a maternal commons but it must include all mothers otherwise it's not a maternal commons at all Kate me my mother the mother on stage and that strange mother with the strange voice in the playground So my paper is titled Crafting Spaces, Motherhood and the Engendered Dialogues of Creativity. In 2016, when I initiated AMMA, the archive for mapping mother artists in Asia, I was driven by the need to acknowledge my self-identification with motherhood as a subject of research. The premise of the project was to recognize the contribution of motherhood in shaping my identity and to a great extent, directing the choices I made in my art practice after I became a mother in 2002. I realized that my engagement with the maternal was personal, but it was a large area of subjective responses, which was conspicuous through its absence. This maternal subjectivity became the scope of the project. Following my interactions with artists and scholars of maternal studies, such as Maril Schoenig, amongst others, I concluded that the maternal identity as a subcategory of womanhood and a significant category of feminist discourse had been hitherto almost missing in the feminist research in Asia. Adding to my surprise, the initial observations and discussions with artists did not provide me with many works of art where the artists had chosen to consider their pregnancy, childbirth and or child care as subject matter or a reference point in their art. Like myself, they too had continued their studio practice, balancing the demands of their personal professional life. 
concomitantly, they had been adjusting and often failing themselves to the predetermined, often programmed participation in art communities, the modules of which did not always work in congruence with their time-space frames. It is these lacunae in the feminist discourse in Asia, the ecosystem of art communities and in the art practice of mother artists, which have given a direction to the project. The voids have been my source of imagining and directing the crafting of new online and on-site spaces, which take into account the following. Inclusive viewing versus selective viewing, celebration versus violation, and maternal presence versus professional absence. I see the launch of the website of Amma as an act of proposing inclusive viewing as opposed to selective viewing, which discounts the embodied experience of experiences of reproduction as subjects of feminist research. Amma challenges selective viewing, one which equates itself with the selective absence or rejection of affiliation with the female body parts, which can have readings of both the sexual and the maternal. Yet, the latter has not been emphatically touched upon. This selective absence of the maternal as a subject has also shaped the rubric towards the study of the female body, where sexual violation over biological celebration has been the reference point for gendered readings of the female body in theory and practice. The breast and the vagina are considered in the light of sexuality, but not for drawing upon narratives on the maternal or reproductive functions they perform. It is in the performance of these biological functions within a sociocultural space in Asia that the politics of creating maternal performance aesthetics can be questioned. Only after the ground for a conscious acknowledgement has been made can one move on to a more geographically and culturally specific studies in maternal performance aesthetics in Asia. The selective affiliation is also gendered reason. in gendered readings has also impelled the crafting of spaces for mother artists in my project. The designing strategies of Amma help in addressing the binaries of the maternal presence and professional absence. I envision these through the following. Building a three-fold manifesto based on mapping, visibility, and mobility of the artists. Creating a range of modules, programs, which encourage flexibility of time schedules, for participations, providing platform to underrepresented artists who have been working slowly but consistently, encouraging established artists to look into their experiences and document their maternal subjectivities, building a network of solidarity and community to foster dialogues on maternal experience between the senior artists and the younger ones, creating a forum on social media for free and open sharing of experiences, and finally, enabling child-friendly spaces or art events which welcome children to accompany their mothers during art activities. This is the website of Amma. It's www.ammaamma.archive.com. This is the first artist residency. I started the website in 2017. Formally. Though the project started in 2016 as a WordPress site. This is Miharu Hatori from Japan. This is Leila Valik Sentuk from Turkey. This is the first Amma Art Workshop. Usually I plan it this way that the residencies, which are short duration, two week residencies, are for international artists, and workshops, which are two day or three day programs, are for Indian artists. This is the first Amma Art Workshop. This is, yeah, the first workshop. The artists at work during the workshop. So we had a forum and a discussion during the first workshop. This is the second residency with Gyok Jion from South Korea. Gyok at work. That's Gyok's work. This is a workshop. Uh, gradually, I've made the uh, the project and the workshops more specific and this is the workshop which took place last year I worked with young mothers who were artists and to discuss their challenges in the art practice the workshop also welcomed
the mothers to bring their children with them. This residency took place uh, in February, March in 2020. It's the first family artist residency where the Japanese artist Yuki Sai and her family joined us for the artist residency program. So that's Yuki and her daughter Uki. That's a family picture. So during her residency, Yuki had the opportunity to do uh, to participate in several activities, which included a workshop, which uh, I organized upon her request. She uh, went around exploring the art spaces, created work, and had some, some family time. Uh, this is one of the two. Uh, events which are forthcoming in 2020, AMA Art Talks, that's discourses on the pandemic, where I'm going to include, I'm going to invite four Japanese artists. Yuki is also going to be uh, a part of this. And they'll talk about their uh, experiences of uh, art making and mothering during COVID times. This is another workshop which is planned for 2020. Uh, these, uh, finally, the project is having some validations. Initial years uh, uh, were quite challenging for me, and I'm really happy that uh, the project is finding its uh, voice through different platforms, such as uh, presentations in uh, universities, documentations in publications. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Hello, my name is Christina. I am a writer and theater maker from Croatia. I'm also a PhD student now, and I'm a mother of two boys, as you can see. Um, so uh, for this panel, I thought of going a little bit back in time. Uh, in 2015, actually. Um, that is the year when Not Now was started by Tina and me. And uh, that's also and, uh, when I moved to UK um, from Croatia. So I was a migrant here. Uh, it was also a time when uh, Bring Your Own Baby to the theatre performance was not such a hit thing like it is today. And I still remember going to London to Young Big Theatre, uh, joining the big PIPA panel, Parents in Performing Arts. So parents all over the industry were trying to make the theatre more accessible, both for the audiences. So inviting parents and carers of, their, of the children to come to theatre and enjoy theatre for grown-ups, so not for children, and uh, be free with their baby in theatre. But also the big important topic was opened up the conversation about how accessible is theater industry to parents themselves. Uh, so I'm going to go back to 2015 when we started working and we did a show called Wonder Woman, The Naked Truth. Uh, it was autobiographical, uh, but it was also highly stylized and um, uh, fun. It was really fun. Uh, so Tina and me were working together with our babies present in the room. So Tina had two boys. I had a small baby, first son. And I'm going to share with you seven lessons that I have learned. This is Tina and me, uh, Wonder Women. Uh, and uh, yes, what we wanted is to make our motherhood visible in our theater work. Because in all the previous productions, we were kind of hiding that we were mothers in order to appear more professional. But this time, we just said, like, it, <laughs> let's just do it full on. So lesson number one, time is a chewing gum. Uh, Basically, what that means is that your creative process will become very long, durational, and it will completely depend on your baby. Babies. And um, on the other hand, when you pay for the childcare and when you don't have babies in the rehearsal room, it's almost like your brain opens a, a taximeter and you're just counting how much money you're spending and you want to be as focused as possible and really 
really work as much as you can. Lesson number two is that your body is always reminding you that you are a mother. So I remember breastfeeding in the rehearsal room, cleaning the poo, dealing with chicken pox, uh, not fitting into the costume, all of this leaking breasts, um, all of this is reminding you and you kind of can't escape from this identity of mother. Lesson number three is that you have to do the work in small amounts of focus. So um, we also did the producing for this show. We were not just uh, creatively uh, developing it. And uh, sometimes producing was even harder than creative process. And I still remember um, visiting a venue manager and trying to make a deal for our show. And it was four o'clock in the evening. We had the whole day working with our kids. They were running around. And the venue manager comes and says, I'm sorry, I had a busy day. And in our mind, it's just like, you have no idea what busy means. So kind of, uh, you have to focus when you have an opportunity and you have to grab it. Lesson number four, when you are working creatively, you have to embrace interruptions. You have to embrace the mess. The mess is the important one. It, it kind of brings something new. So our children were not just there as like we were ignoring them, or like according, uh, just like dealing with their needs. They were so creators of our show. So if they would bring us a toy or start to make noises or sing a song or interrupt us in any way, we would try to make that part of the performance. So the dramaturgy of Wonder Woman, The Naked Truth kind of already had that um, embedded in it from creative process. Uh, so once the performance was performed in front of parents and their babies, it was completely accessible uh, if a parent had to change a nappy or go outside a little bit, come back. Uh, the dramaturgy itself was fragmented and it was, um, uh, it was just uh, free for th those kind of interruptions. Uh, lesson number five is when you need a moment of quiet time, ask for support of your fellow mother. I'm a writer and uh, sometimes just working in the rehearsal room and devising was not enough for me and I, I needed to work on my own. I needed some quiet space. And this partnership with Tina, uh, having another mother next to you is crucial. And uh, the support and the empathy that we developed for each other, uh, that is something that allowed us to work together. Uh, lesson number six was that you have to embrace your migrant mother identity. So I think that mothering and performance is very uh, cultural. And um, the second language, Croatian, so Tina and me are both from Croatia. The second language was constantly present in the rehearsal room. We were talking Croatian to our kids. We were talking Croatian to each other. But then we were performing in, in English with some input from Croatian language. Um, our identity as migrants was also important. Uh, well, um, there was a problem that we didn't have any childcare. There was no family to support us. There were no grandparents who would come and offer some free childcare services. So bringing our kids to the rehearsal room was kind of necessity. And we embraced it. And we also thought that it's important for our children to spend as much time as possible with us and surround themselves with, with that language. Uh, lesson number seven is that coffee means empathy. And I'm going to stress this even more. Building relations and building friendships uh, with other mothers. And it's almost like uh, Tina once said, uh, it's almost like you have an antenna on your head and you can feel another mother across the room. You can almost sense that she needs the help because her kid is screaming or she needs a nappy or she didn't bring uh, tissues. And uh, uh, these kind of recognitions are super important for the creative process and for the theater that you're creating. So these are the seven uh, lessons uh, I wanted to share with you. Uh, these are the lessons that I got from the early mothering experience. Since then, it's been five years. I'm now mother again. And at the moment, I'm also a PhD student. I'm doing PhD research on storytelling. And I have also noticed that not just the theater industry is inaccessible to parents, uh, it's also academia. And I am hoping to 
bring the conversation from artistic prism into the academia and to question how can my experience as an artist, how can that experience help me now as a PhD researcher? Thank you very much. That was all from me. Um, I am Tina. I am going to underpin Christina's um, presentation by something uh, slightly unpredictable because I find maternal performance to be unpredictable. Some things happen that you don't think will happen. Um, so the way I responded to the question, what is maternal performance, was actually by a video collage of my maternal gaze and a poem, an unpredictable poem, which I usually don't write. My maternal performance. I never put my bags down. The load I carry makes me feel like a mule. My mother sometimes says I am the mule. She loves me. She is sad seeing how much I carry. This means physically carry. She is worried about my spine. I carried child one and two. Long roads, cold houses, actors and rehearsals, breastfed while directing a love scene. Was quite good in thinking about two things at the same time. But I cried in the corridors, feeling like I cannot give myself truly neither to one or another. I felt the carrying on my skin, my muscles, my bones, my jaw and my teeth. My breasts have hurt and leaked in the cold, dirty, sweaty rooms with unpacked lunches where theatre was needing to be made. Oh, so we thought. I cried in the morning, leaving my first baby for my first job and spent my lunch breaks in the toilet milking my breasts over the sink. I laughed birthing my second the day after my show opened. I was high on hormones. I have never known a stronger drug and I have known a few. I thought I could birth forever until I found a different thought. Just, just as motherly, but often not seen so. I thought, fuck it. I'm bringing them in and found about bring your own baby option, which is shit, truth be told. But we made a think of it because sometimes it is your best option. Has anyone else ever felt a cold iron taste in your mouth while squeezing a handle on the bus, hoping it would somehow skip the crawling traffic and drive faster because you're late picking them up from the nursery and they charge five pounds for every 15 minutes of lateness per child. The brain waves that so easily connect with another mother in the room, the fellow queen bee we all carry antennae. Only our nests fit into our cars. Fighting the traffic across Birmingham, we meet, meet Mr. Venue. Sorry, Mr. Venue, our children will have a little run around whilst we talk. They were on the bus for the past hour, so excuse them if you would as they crawl up your walls. My smile is etched by my motherhood. The load transforms. Breasts hurt less and word hurts more. My children now pick the washing of the line and we cannot differentiate socks that are mine and that are theirs any longer. We bathe at different times. They know who is I'm on Zoom. Artist, activist, creative, migrant, mentee, director, producer, administrator, loser. No, 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 I'm not loser. But not very successful either, are you? Can I have food? No. No, you can't. I am writing a poem. Reading the bedtime story is more sacred and precious than any other sacred place because I know this lives on borrowed time. 
days change as do my hair and my skin. My life resembles IKEA storage solutions, and the further I am away from the softness of the birth, my body becomes more muscular. I train. I train with house admin, school clubs, screen time, parent pay, reading list, deadline, family time, weekly mother in law update sessions, sitting at the table together and having a meaningful conversation, Zoom meeting, passport extension, lost job, fighting with the internet provider, MOT, parent evenings, white lies, filling the form, research and development, spelling, PE kid tomorrow, missed hospital appointment. I now lift big weights. I am packing. Three weeks away because the money is good and we need to make work. I am both on fire and in pain. Can you over mother? Because if not careful, things and spaces and people, projects that do not need mothering might be mothered. I am reading this, mothering from a great distance. My children are in beds so far away. I siphon my love via Skype in public places. There was a film I watched yesterday where the character drives 1,000 miles a night to meet his loved one. I love driving, especially when I am alone in the car. Don't get me wrong. The windshield wipers ticking off the time as I daydream of my child's hands that like to turn the pages of my book on a Sunday morning when we have a lie-in together.